help keep us on track, I'm going to go ahead and discuss ventricular rhythms, and we can be looking at that uh, in some of your downtime during spring break. Just by the name of it, we know that ventricular rhythms come from the ventricles, and just as a reminder, that's this area down here in the bottom, the ventricles. And there's a couple of different rhythms here. Um, the big ones, of course, are ventricular fibrillation and ventricular tachycardia, but there's also some escape beats and some idioventriculars and premature ventricular beats. Torsades de Point is a version of ventricular tachycardia that's very specific, and you'll see that when you see the rhythm. Um, really not a whole lot we can do for that pre-hospitally, especially at the EM AEMT level, but um, just so you know what we're talking about if you ever hear it. So a ventricular escape beat or ventricular escape rhythm, um, idioventricular rhythm is what we used to call it, IVR. This means that there's a, a spot in the ventricle that is sending out an electrical impulse, um, and we know that it's coming from the ventricles because if we look at the QRS complex, it is very wide. It is definitely more than three little boxes there. Um, so this just looks kind of bizarre when we look at it. But if you look closely, you don't see any P waves, wide QRS complex. This is a, a ventricular beat of some sort. It's regular, so it's probably the same spot. And the, and the complexes all look the same. So it's probably the same spot in the ventricle that's sending out the electrical impulse. So for whatever reason, the SA node is not working and the AV node is not working. So the Purkinje fibers, um, or the ventricles kind of take over. So this is usually a real slow rate. You notice this here is 15 to 40 beats per minute. Real, real slow beat. Um, this may not even be enough to maintain uh, perfusion and uh, blood pressure and keeping somebody conscious. So they may be in and out of consciousness. Although I've seen people with heart rates in their 20s still talking to me and still have decent blood pressures. This person's probably going to get a pacemaker. The next rhythm is just an accelerated idioventricular rhythm. And the only thing that's different with this, because I still have no P waves and I have kind of a wide QRS complex, is this time the rate is much higher. The rate is 60 to 110 beats per minute. So this is just a little bit faster, but it's still wide, so we call it an accelerated idioventricular. The premature, premature ventricular contraction, or PVC, um, <clears throat> this is, for some reason... There's a spot in the heart, in the ventricles, that gets a little um, excited and sends out an electrical impulse ahead of when it's supposed to. And that's where the, the name premature comes from. And this is actually referring to just this complex here. And you notice that there's no P wave before it. There is the T wave, but no, there's the T wave right there. Try to draw an arrow there that you can see. No T wave. I mean, there's a T wave, but no P wave. And it's wide. It's more than um, more than three boxes. Uh, if we look at these, are big boxes that we're looking at here. So it's more than three little boxes. And these can be perfectly normal. People have these. Caffeine stress can do it, uh, but hypoxia can also do it. And sometimes we may see these. They're not closely associated with um, heart attacks, but they used to be thought that. Uh, so sometimes they want to treat it because we're worried that if you have enough of these, they can cause runs of ventricular tachycardia. But you may have had some PVCs at some point in your life. So ischemia, hypoxia, um, increased sympathetic tone, just meaning that the sympathetic nervous system is kicked in, and that may be drug use, could be overexcitation, something really, really scared you. Um, this idiopathic means we don't really know what causes them. Some people just have them, and that's, that's normal. Uh, acid base can do it, and electrolyte imbalances can also do it. So if I look at both of these complexes, and I see one there, and I see one here, they look about the same. So we say the morphology, the way they look, is pretty similar. So we call that unifocal. And what that tells me is that's the same spot in the ventricle that's sending out the electrical impulse. When I have multifocal, and I have one there, and then here at the end I have another, you notice that the point on the first one actually seems to kind of point up and the point on the second one seems to be pointing down. So these are different morphology, they look different, so we call this multifocal. And the more different ones you have means the more spots you have in the ventricles that are firing. So now we have two spots in the ventricles that are firing prematurely. Um, so this is a little bit worse than the, the previous condition. Bigeminy 
whoops, skipped ahead there. Let's see if we can go back. By Gemini. Um, so you notice here I have a complex and then I have a PVC and then I have a complex and then I have a PVC and it's that pattern continues complex PVC complex PVC so it's alternating so we call that by Gemini like a bicycle to every other beat if it's every third beat we call it tri tri Gemini and you can continue that on and call it quadrimony, quintgemony, <clears throat> however many beats there are in between. And then we have this thing called couplet or salvos, and we have both in this. <clears throat> With the couplet, we have two PVCs back to back. And then we have this thing called the salvos, which is one, well, I'll tell you what, let me just do it this way one, two, three of them. And that used to be called a run of ventricular tachycardia, or a run of VTAC. Um, then I'll call it a salvos or just another name for it. It just means you have several PVCs in a row, and then it goes back to a normal complex. That's a concern that this is about to become ventricular tachycardia. And sometimes these will cause the heart to beat and cause a, a pulse with it. Sometimes they won't. So there may be a period here where there's no blood being transfused. Then that can cause them to pass out. So an R on T phenomena is when we have a PVC that occurs on top of a T wave, and then usually put them into ventricular fibrillation afterwards. So if the P R, I'm sorry, if the T, if the PVC falls right on top of a T wave, then it can put them into the VTAC or VFib, and this is similar to what happens to the kid that gets hit in the chest with a baseball or a softball at just the wrong time in the cardiac cycle, which we call commotion cordis. So how bad are these things? Um, there's this lound grading system, and I don't expect you to remember this, or you don't even need to know this. I wouldn't expect this to show up on the test. You'll get it when you go to paramedic school, so I'm just going to go ahead and mention it here. But basically, a grade 0 means you don't have any PVCs, which is good, and then grade 5 is the worst. And you can look at the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, but typically, the higher the number with this one, the worse the condition is. And if you're in that, that 3, 4, 5, then maybe even a 2, they might want to do something to try to treat the PVCs. Just an occasional one. Grade 1, if you have several of them in a row, you might have a grade 2. We call that frequent. And that one down there looks like it's trigeminy. Um, multi-form or multifocal PVCs, which we showed earlier, and then grade fours, couplets or solvos. There's a couple of couplets there, and then the R on T is considered the worst. Now this rhythm here is ventricular tachycardia, and you'll notice that it's kind of wide and funny looking. There's no real, what we would say is a normal QRS. Um, so here we say it's wide and bizarre in morphology. Uh, greater than three boxes wide. Um, if you were to measure from wave to wave, I don't even want to call that a T wave or a QRS complex, but you measure wave to wave, and it's it's more than, than three little boxes. Um, and these are typically fast, um, anywhere from 100 to 250 beats per minute. And it's usually regular. Now, as far as treating this, <clears throat> um, we break it into stable or unstable. And as advanced EMTs, you're not going to have them on the monitor to really know the what rhythm that are in here, but if you're working with a paramedic, this is one that tends to make us just a little bit on the anxious side. Now, if they're stable, that means they typically still have a good blood pressure, they're still perfusing okay, they're talking to us, skin is normal, not seeing any signs of shock, and unstable means they're shock. And then there's also a way we can break it down into regular or irregular. And if they're stable, we try to treat it with medications. If they're unstable, then we're going to go ahead and use cardioversion, which is similar to defibrillation. You'll get to do that in paramedic school. This is torsades to points, and we call it flipping to the points. And if you <clears throat> kind of look at this, you almost see a up and down and up and down and up and down or a flipping of these points. This is a specific type of VTAC. And uh, if we see this and we're comfortable calling it, then we might need to give a medication called magnesium. Because uh, sometimes if we see this, our magnesium level is too low. So we go ahead and give magnesium and hopefully that will reverse it. Here's probably a better picture 
of a uh, Torsades. And then we have kind of the granddaddy of them all, B-fib, ventricular fibrillation, BF. Um, I always called it B-fib. The full name is ventricular fibrillation. As of late, I've been hearing it called VF more, so I'm trying to say that to be with all the cool kids. Uh, but if you look at it, there's no real pattern to this. It's pretty chaotic. It looks almost like little VTAC here, but even then, it's it's still somewhat irregular. And if your patient is talking to you, they're not in VFib. With this, they are not going to be perfusing. Now, there may be a few seconds from when they go into BFib to when they actually pass out. And sometimes that can be 5 or 10 seconds. But typically, when we see this, they're not going to be conscious and we're going to be doing CPR on them. And, of course, what is needed here is the defibrillator. So for this one, we may call this like coarse BFib. And then we can also get a real fine BFib. So if you look at this, it's harder to to see ventricular fibrillation, but I don't know if I want to call that flat line or straight line either, which would be a systole. So we'd still call this probably a fine ventricular fibrillation. Now the AEDs that we use are supposed to recognize these and we'll go ahead and defibrillate them. They will also recognize VTAC, which can be a problem because sometimes VTAC has a pulse, which is why we never put an AED on someone that has a pulse. If they don't have a pulse and it is in VTAC, then we treat it like we would ventricular fibrillation or VF. So for this, we'll defibrillate. We use AEDs. Paramedic will use a manual defibrillator, which starts at 200 joules, then goes up to 300 joules, and then goes up to 360 joules. So they'll select their energy, they'll charge up, and then they'll hit the shock button, and hopefully you are clear and out of the way before they do that. All right, pretty short. If you have any questions, please uh, message me in Moodle or ask me when I see you in class.